All right, last lecture we discussed how to estimate the error in finite element solutions. How much error it was caused by limiting the space of solution from the infinite, no, infinite dimensional space in the weak form of the differential equation to a finite dimensional space, which we can represent as a linear combination of a few basis functions and derive a set of algebraic equations for the linear combination coefficients. So the area estimate we have looked at are mostly a priori area estimates because the precise form of the error is going to depend on the particular solution, not the approximate solution. Right? So, so finally, in the last lecture, we derived several facts. One is that in the energy norm, the finite element solution was the optimal in how much error it has. And in both H1 and L2 norm, the finite element solution is optimal up to a certain factor, right? up to a certain finite factor that doesn't depend on the grid size. That enables us to bound the finite element solution error by one particular type of approximation, which is piecewise linear interpolant. And uh, the precise error of the piecewise linear interpolant actually then depends on the curvature, which is the second order derivative of the actual solution, not the finite element solution. Therefore, that is an a priori error estimate. The form of the error depends, the, depends on the actual solution. And this lecture we will talk about a posteriori error estimate which we are going to derive a form of an error estimate that actually depends on not the real continuous solution, but the discrete solution. That is some error estimate we can actually compute. right? So in order to introduce that kind of a posteriori error estimate, the posteriori estimate cannot be actually applied to the entire solution. It can only be applied to output functional on the solutions. So what does that mean? So it means we have a finite element uh, solution written in a weak form. So this is the weak form where u and v is in the solution and test space, infinite dimensional. We are going to restrict ourselves to a finite dimensional space where we get our finite element solution. What we're interested in is not usually the entire solution. We are interested in a particular finite number of quantities computed from the solution. And here I'm going to write this as LO of, of U. What are some examples of this L of U? In aerodynamics problems, this may be the lift or drag of an airplane. In heat transfer problems, if I'm interested in solving for a temperature field that concerns uh, the, the damage due to heat to some material, I may be interested in the maximum temperature in a certain material. right? So, so these are quantities I'm interested in. This is the quantities that tells me why am I solving this PDE. Okay, so that is LO of U that, let's say, for example, give me just a one single number. LO itself is a linear functional. So it is a linear functional of the solution. All right. So the error estimate should approximate the difference between LO operated on the finite element solution minus the same functional operated on the real solution. So here I'm trying to estimate if I spent a million times more computational effort getting a much better approximation, how much difference does that make to my quantity of interest? 
if the difference is minor, is small compared to, let's say, other uncertainties from the setup of, of the problem, let's say the material properties, etc., then I shouldn't spend this additional effort solving the PD to much more accuracy. But if the error turns out to be large, I and uh, it's it's large compared to other sources sources of uncertainty, and I have the computational resources, then I should spend the computational time refining the grid and getting a more accurate solution, right? So so this is what we are trying to approximate. And the linearity of the output functional allows me to say this is actually equal to LO operated on UH minus U, right? So that's simply linearity. So how do I estimate that quantity? To estimate that quantity, I'm going to introduce another equation. I'm going to introduce what's called the adjoint equation. Remember, what are the place? What is the place that a linear functional appeared before? It's the right hand side of a weak form, right? So the trick in this a posteriori area, area estimate is to introduce or invent another weak form that uses this LO, which is a different linear functional from the L in the differential equation. So I'm going to introduce another equation that uses this LO as the right-hand side of the weak form. Particularly, I'm going to introduce an adjoint equation that is A star, which is different from this A also. I'm going to tell you what A star has to be a little bit later. So let me call this U hat being the solution of this different differential equation, and V has to equal to LO of V for all possible Vs. Remember, this LO has to be operated on the difference between UH and U. So this V in this differential equation should belong to the space of XU, right? That's the space where U has to belong to. So the test space of this adjoint equation is the primal space, is the space of, is the solution space, the, tri the also called trial space of the original differential equation. Okay, and it turns out that my u, u hat, the solution, whose solution u hat should be in the, uh, the xv, should be in the space of the test functions in the original differential equation. Okay, so how is this going to be helpful? Let's... <coughs> Let's try to use the manually constructed differential equation to figure out how do I further derive, th derive this. So if I have this, then my I know that for all v in this xu, this weak form is equal. So that allows me to substitute this particular u h minus u into v. This is going to give me a star of u hat and uh minus u, right? Okay, now here comes to what this a star has to be. So the reason it's called the adjoint equation is that a star and the a in the original equation, they are adjoint operators. So a star and a are so-called adjoint in that the definition of adjoint is that a of u v is exactly equal to a star of v and u for all pairs of u and v. So this is u, this is v. If these a's are matrices, what does adjoint mean? They're just transpose, exactly, exactly. So A star in finite dimensional sense would be just transpose of A. Okay, so now we know that A star of U hat and U H minus U is equal to A of U H minus U and U hat. 
right? So here we use the original differential equation. Oh, before that, we are going to expand it using the bilinearity of A. So first of all, u hat is a member of xv. So by the original differential equation, by this original differential equation, if v, if I substitute v uh, by u hat, what I get is this is equal to L of what? U hat, right? Okay, so therefore this whole thing is equal to A of U H U hat minus L of U hat. Or, so let's look at what is the consequence of this equality we derived. The error in the output linear functional okay, is equal to the left hand side minus right hand side if you look at the original equation okay this is the original equation left hand side is a of u v right hand side is l of v here this is a of h u h and u hat the, this is the right hand side l of u hat so this is the residual of the original differential equation when I substitute the solution u by the finite dimensional finite element solution uh and I substitute the v the test function by this solution of the adjoint equation u uh hat so remember this is just the a of u v minus l of v so this is a of u h of this for v uh, is particularly equal to u hat so why is this an a posteriori error estimate because this formula involves u h not u right and this formula is up to now exact we make no approximation whatsoever. The only approximation we are going to make is to V, because here, V is still the exact solution, the exact solution of the adjoint equation. Right? So we are going to solve V using numerical method and substitute that V into this error formula, and we get an error estimate. I mean, it's an estimate because I'm solving a numerical approximation for V, not the exact V. If I have the exact V in some, some way, then I have an exact formula for the error.